Okay, so you be ready for when we call you, then you come. Are you guys Swamiji? It's me. Welcome, Swamiji. Swamiji, welcome. Pranam. Hari Om, Swamiji. Hari Om, Hari Om. The Swamiji is mute. No, no, he spoke. Swamiji is not even, I'm not able to hear. No, we can hear Hello? Swamiji. Hello? Yes. Yeah, but, but, but. Swamiji Pranam. Namaskar, Namaskar. Namaskar, Pranam Maharaj. Pranam Maharaj. I don't know any noise. Swamji, we'll wait for uh, five minutes uh, till yeah. people come and uh, join. Okay. Swamiji, what is the best way to invite you to our Vedantic Center of Nebraska, where we would be honored to have your discourse there also. What would be the best way to connect with you? Well, you can just write to me, send me an email. You can do that. Is there a preferred right. email, Swamiji? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Swamiji. Welcome. We just uh, inaugurated a Sant Sadhan in the Hindu Temple of Omaha in Nebraska. And uh, we have 12 saints that we have uh, installed in the Sant Sadhan. And our idea is that we want to invite internet scholars like you to come and talk, give this course. Oh, very good. So we. Sorry, Swamiji, I can't hear you. So, which saints do you have installed? So we started with, uh, on one, so chronologically speaking, we started with Brahmarishi Vashishtha, then Vishwamitra, and then we went through uh, Agastya mm -hmm. and uh, moved on to Gargi Maitreyi, then Mirabai Tulasi Das, and then we have Adi Shankaracharya, so Ramakrishna wow. Paramahamsa, and Swami Vivekananda. Oh, very good. Uh, Maharshi Patanjali also. So 12 saints uh, in a chronological <laughs> order. Very nice. I'm very happy you have done that. That's very good. Thank you, Swamiji. I will send you a link to our Sant Sadhan by email. Then you okay. may please uh, see it. And we would be honored with your presence uh, in yeah. that Sadhan. I'll be happy, dear. Thank you. When do you foresee that travel will begin? What's your projection? <laughs> 
everything is so uncertain. I mean, on one hand, they're distributing vaccines and it's becoming safer. On the other hand, we are also seeing in some parts, there is a surge coming and some people are refusing to take vaccines, refusing to put masks. So it's a very mixed picture. So we'll see. I don't think, I think it's going to be kind of a very gradual process. I don't think it's suddenly everything is going to open. Hope, hopefully it happens sooner than later. <laughs> we'll see. Well, yes, we will see, as you said. <laughs> When I was a student, Swami Prabhudhananda had come from California mm -hmm. to give a talk in my university in Texas. Oh, okay. This was almost 25 years ago. Yes. Were you in any touch with him uh, from the well, yeah, he, well, he, well, he was much senior to me. Right. Uh, yeah, he loved me very much. He passed away a few years ago. Oh, Ram. Um, I think probably four or five years ago. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I visited, he worked in our San Francisco center. I visited there often right. and he was very, very affectionate. Yeah, very to me, yeah. Well, we students connected with him very quickly when he came to our campus. Swami, yeah, yes. Swamiji, I'm very sorry to hear about uh, Swami Vageshwara Nanji Maharaj. Yes, he was our vice president. We had a, yes, we had a very close association with him in Bombay. We used okay. to live in Bombay, Maharaj. Oh, but Bombay was the ashram where I joined in the 70s. Yes, Maharaj, I read it, uh, Pampushan, myself. 70s. And uh, you may be knowing my uh, family there, the Dr. Call, Kashnat Call. Yeah. The old Puna family, all of them. We... Yes, the name does sound familiar, yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Oh, lecture, Aram Chichi. <laughs> That's a beautiful ashram, Maharaj. Mm. Well, morning, Homa, etc. Went uh, in the Mandir. Very long. Upload Pandrangla and Andrea. Mara, shall we start? Yes, we are. We can start. Okay. Start. Okay. We can mute everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Santoji, please mute everybody. Except me and Swamiji. Okay. 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 But I would request everybody to please uh, I think even you got muted. Can you hear me, Maharaj? Yeah, now I can hear you, yes. Oh, okay. Okay, I am here in the vicinity of our <laughs> temple. So, Pranam Maharaj, thank you so much. And uh, from the bottom of the heart of, uh, uh, or from my heart, and uh, uh, we are all sitting uh, at the pious feet of Lord Venkateshwara here. And, uh, you know, thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, the whole board of uh, trustees and our executive committee and all of and, uh, you know, <laughs> highly, highly grateful to you for that. And I express my gratitude on behalf of everyone to you. So let's start uh, today's, uh, you know, uh, discourse. Today's discourse, Swamiji's, uh, you know, title of the discourse is Worship as Seva. What a beautiful title. What a beautiful topic to talk on. And uh, uh, I want to talk a little about Swamiji. You know, there is a lot and a lot to talk about Swamiji. And uh, a lot and a lot to talk about Swamiji. So... I just want to say, uh, you know, Swami Tyagadana Ji, a monk of the Ramakrishna order since 1976, is the head of the Vedanta Society in Boston uh, and, is the, and, is, and is the Hindu 
Chaplin at Harvard and MIT. He has written, translated, and edited 12 books so far, and uh, uh, including uh, mo monasticism, ideal, and traditions, the essence of uh, Gita, interpreting Ramakrishna, uh, Ramakrishna through that, and then uh, walking the uh, walking the a man karma uh, yoga and his latest book knowing the knower a manual of yoga yoga he has presented papers at the academies and he gives lectures and classes the vedanta society as well uh, as at mit uh, harvard and to other on Swami Ji, and uh, you can uh, really listen to, uh, to his various topics. Thank you very much, Swami Ji. It is where you are, all your talks are extremely inspiring. Thank you very much. And we got feedback yesterday. And uh, they understood uh, each and every part of it. How much, Swamiji? Please go ahead and proceed. Flo floor is yours. Satoma Satkamaya Tamaso. Go ahead, Swamiji. Can you all hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Om Satoma Satkamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Rityorma Amrutam Gamaya Aviravir Magedi Rutrayate Takshina Nenamam Pahi May the divine lead from the unreal to the real from darkness to light. From death to reality. So, those of you who were able to uh, listen to the talk yesterday evening, the topic was bringing God home. And yesterday we tried to see <clears throat> why we go to the temple, what are the spiritual benefits that can come to us when we go to a temple how God is not simply present in the murti itself. It's not simply a murti, but that it is the living presence of God. And how that living presence of God we feel inside a temple can also be felt in our little family shrine that every one of us has at home. And ultimately, the best shrine for God is our own heart. Swami Vivekananda said that the best temple for God is our own heart. And the more we are able to make our heart pure, the longer and better will be the place we create for God in our heart. And then we will be able to feel that presence of God in the heart and that will fill our own life with peace, joy, contentment. And we are able to then share that joy, that love, with not only our members of our family, but our friends and ultimately the community of which we are a part. A great sage <clears throat> who was a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna and a brother disciple of Vivekananda, his name was Swami Brahmananda. He used to say that if in the family, even if there is one person in the family who is devoted, who lives according to dharma, who meditates and prays every day, the whole family gets the benefit of that. And therefore, by being truly religious, by being truly spiritual, we are not only doing benefit to our own selves, 
but it is also a form of service. It's also a form of seva to our family, to our friends, and to our neighborhood. So that is what I would like to focus on this morning, <clears throat> on how seva is a form of worship, and worship is a form of seva. The two are not different. Many times when we go to the temple, not many of us are familiar with all the rituals. That's why we have specialized priests, those who have had training. They not only know all the mantras, they also know how to do all these rituals. Now, not every one of us is trained in these rituals. Not every one of us knows these mantras. So we go to a temple, <clears throat> we see, we offer worship, and then the priest does the worship on our behalf. Most of the time, most of us don't understand the meaning of the mantras they chant. Most of the time, we don't even know the significance of the different rituals that are done. All that we know is that something sacred is being done, something holy, something auspicious is being done. Now, clearly, when we do worship inside a temple, we need specialized training. Now, many of us, we have our own little small mandir, small little shrine at home, where we worship our family deities and whatever other deities we have. And all of us try to do <clears throat> some kind of a worship, even if it is not a very rigorous, trained form of ritual. So we offer some flowers and we might have a do little arati and use a little incense. So we have our own form of worship at home as well. The most important thing in the worship is not the ritual per se, not even the mantras per se. There is a saying which says, Bhava Grahi Janardana. The God looks at the heart of the devotee. So the mantras and the rituals are important, but they will become truly powerful, they will become truly meaningful only if the heart with which that worship is done that heart is completely filled with faith, filled with bhakti towards God. Otherwise, just an empty ritual that you are chanting the correct mantras, you're doing the proper rituals, but in your mind, you're thinking, oh, what will I have my dinner tonight? Or what, what are the things I need to do shopping tomorrow? So that kind of a mechanical form of ritual, a mechanical form of repeating the mantras is not helpful. So the most important thing is our heart. And every puja, every worship is a kind of service. <clears throat> you see, uh, yes, e even in our Hindu tradition, there is not one universal form of worship. Those of us who have had an opportunity to travel in different parts of India or see or go to different temples in northern parts of India, in southern parts of India, in eastern part, in western parts, we see that not only the architecture of the temple is not completely identical, South Indian temples look very different from many North Indian temples, but the rituals also are not exactly identical. And that's fine. That's the beauty of the Sanatana Dharma is, there is not just one way of doing things. We have got, and it's a very old tradition. It's the oldest tradition. And therefore it's not unusual that we have many different ways of doing the ritual. Of course, we all already have so many different languages, so many different ways of observing festivals. So what is common to all of these forms of worship is that every worship, we see that God 
as a kind of a divine guest. So when we have an honored guest visiting our home, we try to do everything to make the stay of that honored guest comfortable, happy, joyful. So whenever any puja is done, we are really inviting God, please come and be our guest. And that is why we keep the temple clean. We keep everything clean because we want to offer a clean, welcoming place for the divine guest. God is our divine guest. And then in many times in a ritual, they'll have, if it's a short ritual, sometimes they call it Pancha Upachar Puja, a puja done with five items. Or a Dashopachar Puja, a puja that is done with 10 items. Or a Shodashopachar Puja, which is done with 16 items. Now these are things that are offered. Either they are five items or 10 or 16, these are offerings made. And therefore, for instance, in one kind of way the puja is done, one of the first thing that is done in the 16 item puja, for instance, is they offer a seat, asana. And there are appropriate mantras to be chanted. The next is padyam. The padyam because in ancient times, whenever any guest came, that time they didn't wear shoes, they just walked, they didn't drive. And so the first thing when a guest came at home was to offer water to wash their feet. And that is why whenever we go to a temple, we find, make sure that we remove our shoes, our feet are washed if possible, clean, so that we can walk inside. And so in one way like this, so first water is offered for washing the feet, then some water is offered for drinking, and then... Um, and if the guest has come from a far distance, we say, why don't you have a bath or take a shower? So we offer snaniyam. That's also part of the 16 item puja. And then we offer vastram. So cloth, a comfortable cloth, which the guest can then be comfortable. And then one by one, we offer flowers and incense and food. All of these items then ultimately add up to 16. Now. Whenever we do this puja in the temple, the priest who actually does the puja and the bhaktas, the devotees, who are, see, sometimes when we are in a priest may be doing the puja, we might have devotees sitting and then just talking among themselves because they don't know what is going on. They don't understand what's going on. And so people are just kind of talking about all sundry matters among themselves. Now, puja is not a performance. Puja is a living presence. God is actually present there. And that is why even those who are watching a worship being done should either be praying or meditating or seeing, looking at the altar, looking at the puja being done and seeing that God has arrived there. God is being worshipped, that God is the guest. So that idea is very important. So those who are watching the puja in a temple should be as actively engaged in what is happening as the priest is. It's not like, oh, now the puja has started. You just get go in front when the arati is being done and then, then be ready for the prasad. There is, that is just, that comes in the end. That is important. But also participating in a puja means recognizing that God has actually been invoked through these appropriate mantras and a, a special presence of God is there that time. Only if I can watch the puja with that spirit, then I derive the complete benefit of that puja. So that is a form of seva, of service. So once there is this incident in the life of uh, Swami Vivekananda, so he said that once when he was with his guru, Sri Ramakrishna, and they, there were many other devotees and disciples present, Sri Ramakrishna said that among the things that are advised in spiritual life, that we have to help other people. And he said, there is this idea about compassion. 
compassion for the needy, compassion for the poor. And Ramakrishna Paramahamsa said that, no, who are we to have compassion? What we need is not compassion, but service. That serving others, recognizing that God is present in them. So just like puja or worship is service inside a temple, that kind of a puja can occur even outside the temple. That God is present in everyone. Not only in the people I like, the people I love, but in everyone. God is present not only in my own heart, but God is present in the hearts of my members of my family, my friends, my community. God, there is no such thing as a Hindu God or a Christian God and a Muslim God and a Buddhist God. God is one. That is what the Rig Veda says. Ekam Sat Vipra Bahudha Vadanti. God is one. May be called by different names, worshipped in different ways, using different language, different rituals, but God is one. So, whenever I go about carrying out my duties and responsibilities in life, I will meet many kinds of people. People who are Hindus, people who are not Hindus. And those of us who are living in North America, Hindus are, are a minority. So, in the course of the day, we are going to meet a lot more people who are not fellow Hindus. So therefore, if I remember that God is one and God is present in the hearts of all, then I will not make that distinction as far as my regular duties and responsibilities are concerned. I'm going to say, it doesn't matter whether the person in front of me is Hindu or not, but there is the same God present in that person's heart as well. So I will respect that person. I will help that person. So my service, my help should be extended to all. That is the teaching of the Sanatana Dharma, that this entire world is one family. There is a very beautiful verse, an ancient Sanskrit verse, which goes like this. Ayam nijaha parova iti ganana lagu chetasam udara charitanantu vasudhaiva kutumbakam. You might have heard this last phrase quoted very often. Vasudhaiva kutumbakam, the whole world is one family. So the beginning part of that verse means, ayam nijaha, this person is our own person. Parova, those are others. Sometimes people might think, oh, we are all Hindus. Those people are not Hindu. So this kind of a distinction we make. But presently, for instance, the kind of distinction that is being made because the, the immigration problem has become so major uh, that people think, oh, this is, these are outsiders. These are insiders. So all these distinctions we made, outsider, insider, Hindus, non-Hindus, Indians, non-Indians, Americans, non-Americans, all these distinctions, iti ganana laghu chetasam, laghu means small, chetas means the mind. So small-minded people make this distinction like this. this is mine, that is not mine. This is ours, that is theirs. When our hearts are small, when our mind becomes narrow, we create walls, we build these compartments and create divisions among people. Then the second line says, Udara Charitanantu. When my heart expands, when my heart becomes big, when I'm able to see the presence of God in everyone without distinction, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. Then I see that this whole family, this whole world is one family. Yes, there are going to be borders, there will be national boundaries. You will still need visa to go to some countries. All those things we can follow. But spiritually speaking, deep inside the heart, we see that all are one. And it's not just only about human beings. What our Sanatana Dharma teaches us, that even in the tiniest of creatures, even in the ant, the jiva 
inside the ant and the jiva inside my own heart are not different. Even the jiva inside of the tiniest worm is the same jiva as the jiva in me. So there is no higher or lower. Now, society we know in, in social life, we make these gradations. There is, of course, the, the big thorny question about the caste system in Indian society. So yes, there are these four varanas. But what the, when the system itself started, it was meant as an act of duty. What are the duties connected with different groups in society? And as duties, they are wonderful because we know that all of us don't have same duties, but together, all of us with different duties, we make society worth living. There is a story sometimes told that um, uh, Sita Devi, once she told Rama, after the killing of Ravana, they're all back in Ayodhya. And then Sita once told Rama, she said, <clears throat> why are there poor people? <clears throat> why can't we make everything available to everybody? Nobody will be lacking in anything. And, and then Rama smiled and he said, no, that's not how it is. There are going to be people who have more. There are going to be people who have less. There are going to be different skills. But, but Sita Devi said, no, no, no. I, let's bring plenty of things to everyone. Nobody will be in need of anything. And so the story goes, Rama said, all right. And so that's what they did. And then next time the rainy season came <clears throat> and the heavy rain came and then some roofs started leaking. And now they wanted to go and bring some roofers. Can you come and fix this roof? There was nobody available because everybody had plenty. And so no one, there was nobody available. And then this is only a story. We don't even know whether it is there in any official Ramayana. But the idea was that this kind of a different skills uh, will always be there. Nobody, we cannot say everyone will have the same duty. So the social structure will have these different duties. The problem is not that there are these structures in society. The problem is that the emphasis moved from duties to rights. Today, very few people ask, what is my duty? Most people ask, what are my rights? That's why if you see the constitutions of many countries, there is the bill of rights. But what right I have? There isn't any bill of duties. What duties I have? And therefore, if we forget that every right that I have is associated with a duty, only if I do my duty well, can I claim that right? Now, for a long time, for many centuries, everybody was thinking about rights and privilege. What privilege I have? That is why all the problem has started. The problem has not started because there are these different social structures. The problem started because the emphasis moved from duty to rights. <clears throat> so when we do this service, when we try to look at people, irrespective of the differences, if we try to remember that the same divine being is present in the heart of all, <clears throat> first of all, we'll be following what our Shastras say. And secondly, that is the only way to be truly happy and contented. Otherwise, we'll spend our entire life just fighting, arguing, quarreling with people. And where is peace then? And we know that time is limited. None of us knows how long we are going to be around. And so in this uncertain times, and now, of course, during the, in this COVID and pandemic, we know how vulnerable we are. With all the great advances that we have done, yes. Because of advances now, we have the vaccine fairly sooner than would have been possible even 20 or 30 years ago. So that is wonderful. But even then, it took at least a year for the vaccine to come out. And within that time, 
we have lost hundreds and thousands of lives. Only if any of us have had people known to us amongst our relatives, among our family, or amongst our friends who might have been affected by the pandemic, we know how terrible it has been. Because sometimes when we read these numbers in the papers or see them in the news, it just seems, oh, 50,000 new cases were today, and then 2,000 died today. It just becomes a number. What we don't remember is that every one of those 2,000 people who died was a father or mother to someone, was a son or daughter to someone. Some family's life has been completely affected by that loss. So we know how vulnerable we are to forces of nature. We cannot control it fully. So the time that we have in our hand, how can I use it best in a best way? Which is the best way to do it? And the best way to do it is through service. Service means saying you first me afterwards. The person who says in everything, first me, first me, that is what the Gita says is a selfish person. Unselfish person will say, yes, of course, not that I don't want anything, but if I see there is someone who needs it more, I will say, brother or sister, you go first the more the number of people like this we have in society, the happier we will be. The world will be a better place. There is a, a composition by a great poet saint, Vidnemad Bhartrahari. He wrote a set of verses called Niti Shataka, a hundred verses on ethics and morality. And in one verse, Bhartrahari says that <clears throat> he makes a study of how society is. So this is how that verse goes. He says, Ete satpurushaha parartha ghatakaha swartham parityajaye jaye samanyastu parartha mudyama pritaha swartha virodhenage temi manavarakshaha parahitam Swarthaya nignanti ye, ye tu gnanti nirathakam parahitam, teke na jani mahe. So, what Bhartra is saying is there are four kinds of people in every society. The first kind, he says, are sat purushas. They are really good people. Not just good people, they are like the, the salt of the earth, as they say. They are like the, the best in any society. And what is their specialty? And that specialty is this. A.K. Satpurushaha Paraartha Ghatakaha They work for other people. They help other people. They work to bring joy to other people. Paraartha Ghatakaha Swartha Virodhenage So they are willing to help other people even if it causes some inconvenience to them. They don't care for their own comfort, their own joy. They say, my goal is to make other people happy and comfortable. So it's completely unselfish. That is the first group. The second group, Bhartrari says, are samanya, the generality of people, the average people. And what do they do? Samanyastu parartha mudyama prutaha. They also want to help other people. Swartha avirodhinagi. They want to help other people as long as it doesn't affect them. In other words, let us say, if someone's income is such that they have, say, $300. So after covering all their expenses and all their savings, etc., someone can say, oh, Every month, say I have 200 or $300 I can use to help other people. So then such people will say, this much amount in my budget I keep to help other people. But if at any time more is needed than that, I will say, sorry, I can't do that. 
for the comfort of me and my family. I can give $300, but not more. So they're good people. They want to help, but they don't want to discomfort themselves more than a certain limit. So that is the second quality. So there are two. First, Satpurushaha, who will help without thinking of themselves at all. Second, who want to help, but there is a certain limit up to how much they will help. And generally we will see most people in every society will belong to the second group. Most people are good. They want to be helpful. But they, all, they also put a limit to how much help they can give. Then the third group. Bhartirari says, the third type, he says, Manava Rakshasa. The third are Rakshasas. They are demons. Manava Rakshasa. They look like human beings, but they are actually demons. What do they do? They Manava Rakshasa Parahitam Swarthaya Nignantiye. These people are willing to destroy other people, destroy other people's happiness to make themselves happy. So if they stand to benefit something, they don't mind hurting other people for that. They are Manava Rakshasa. They are Rakshasas. Now, are there any more? And then Bhartirari says, yes, there is one fourth category also. And the fourth category, he says, Yetu Gnanti Nirarthakam Parahitam Tekena Jani Mahe. He said there is one fourth category. And he said they are so terrible I don't even know what to call them. They came a jani mahe. He said, I don't have any name for them. What do they do? They destroy other people's happiness without gaining anything themselves. They just get, they don't even get this thing. They just say, I'm just going to hurt other people. So every society in any part of the world will have these four groups. Satpurushaha, the best among the people, Samanyaha, the average people, Manava Rakshasaha, the Rakshasas among people, and this fourth, the terrible people who will hurt others without gaining anything. So the health of any society, and that's true not just of a larger society, of a community as well. So the, the temple community or the Hindu community can also look at it as a one unit and say, that in our unit, how many Satpurushas are there? How many average people are there? And God forbid, do we have any Rakshasas amongst us? And are they even this worst kind of people? So improving society or improving any community means trying to reduce the number of these Rakshasas. You see, in our Shastras in our Mahabharata, Ramayana, we, we read about Rakshasas. That oftentimes seem very simplistic way. They are showed as very weird sort of people. They don't have to be that way. They could have been just human beings, human beings like us. But their character, their actions were such that we just call them Rakshasas. So we have to, and then every one of us should look inside our own heart and say, to which of these four categories do I belong? You see, sometimes, and then this many of you will have noticed, um, um, sometimes when we are flying, and I see this often in, in, uh, in, uh, in international flights, <clears throat> and I'm sure all of you have noticed it as well. Oftentimes, you know, it's big aircrafts, so sometimes they will say, we are going to now board people according to the, the rows that you are seated in. And so they say, everyone remains seated. We'll call out the rows or the zone you are in, and then you go. And it's sometimes, sometimes it's very beautiful. People are very disciplined. And as the rows are called out, they go and stand. But sometimes you will have noticed that irrespective of what rows are called out, everybody wants to go first and they'll just kind of crowd there. It's a mess. And, um, and, um, and it's, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say this, but it's, it's, it's been really 
a bigger mess I find in, in India um, than in many other parts. And it happens everywhere. I'm not saying, but, but it really is painful. Now, when we say I'm a religious person or I'm a spiritual person, it's in simple things like this, that if say I need to go first so that I can get a place for my carry-on to put, and I don't care if even if my turn comes afterwards. So that's, that's where this selfishness or unselfishness, it's like sometimes we might think, oh, I'm not a very selfish person, but our selfishness can manifest in small little things like this. So that is what, Seva, seva really means thinking of the other person before myself. And if we are able to do that, it will bring us peace of mind. It will even bring us better health. A lot of health problems that we have is because of this continual stress and anxiety and worry and tension that we live through day after day after day. Now, some of that stress may not be because of our own doing, but a lot of the stress that we do definitely can be minimized or eliminated if we just change our way of thinking. And way of doing that would be to see that looking upon everyone as a manifestation of God, that if the divine being is present everywhere, if God is truly present everywhere, if God is present in my heart, then the God is present in the heart of everyone. And that would be a true form of seva, a true form of worship. So I would encourage all of you to read Swami Vivekananda's Karma Yoga book because it will be helpful to everyone. Because we have, all of us have different duties and responsibilities in life. And if we are able to carry them out well, carry them out properly, we will make our own life truly blessed. So there are these four yogas that Swami Vivekananda has taught. There is Karma Yoga, there is Bhakti Yoga, Raja Yoga, and Jnana Yoga. Their books are very not very big. So please try, if possible, some of you I'm sure have heard of them or read them. But if not, <clears throat> please, either you can buy those books or most of them are available online as well. So please, please read them. Try to understand what is being said and try to see how you can practice it in your own life. Because ultimately, the real test of spirituality is not how often you have gone to a temple or how many pujas you have given or how many books you have read. The ultimate test is what kind of a person I am. How will I know whether I'm making progress or not? We can look, see a lot of times we make the mistake of comparing ours with other people. That's very unhealthy. We should compare ourselves with ourselves. So I should look at my own life and say, how was I as a person five years ago? And how I am now? Do I see any improvement? If I was short-tempered five years ago and I'm even more short-tempered now, then there is no improvement at all. So in terms of being calm, quiet, joyful, have I made any progress? Because ultimately, as I said, the test of spirituality is, is, have I become a better person? Have I become more unselfish? Have I become more kind? Have I become more loving? That is what will matter. Otherwise, one can say, I'm, I'm going to the temple last 25 years. I've given so many pujas. I have given so much money in donation. None of that will help. All of those things are good. That's great. But if I have not improved as a person, then those things will not help. So the ideal is, spirituality is inner transformation, changing our own heart. That we become 
role models. And that's especially an important for elders in a family that parents should become role models for their children. The children should feel, that's why in the Shastras we read, Matru Devo Bhava, Pitru Devo Bhava, Acharya Devo Bhava. So if I try to become role models for the next generation, then my life will improve and then my children's life will also improve because then they have a model to look up to. And then looking at the way they see how their parents are living, that's how the children, when they grow up and when they will become parents, they will live like that. That's how this whole society will improve. It cannot be improved simply through just political agitation and protests. Those have their place. That is all right. But ultimately, it's about how we live our lives, how we in harmonious way, we live in a family, we take care of each other, we help each other. That is the way that we learn. So going to a temple, doing puja, doing worship, trying to understand the heart of worship or what it means, what it does, is going to be very, very helpful for all of us. So that is my prayer for all of us today, that may this association with the temple that you have, that we all have, no matter to which place we are in, to which city we are living in, whatever association with we have with the nearest mandir, may that association bring greater joy, fulfillment in our lives. May we be able to make our own lives blessed. May the temple become a place of worship, but also a place of service, a place of learning, a place of harmony, a place of understanding. That is what we want the ideal temples in every part of the world to be. So that is my prayer and that is my wish. So with that, I now invoke the blessings of Lord Venkateshwara and God in whichever form is worship anywhere in the world. May that divine being bless us, protect us, guide us, and help us every moment of our life. Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Tat Sat. Thank you very much, Swamiji. Thank you very much. Uh, worship uh, is a seva. Undoubtedly, it is seva. Uh, I'm very grateful to you. All There's a great uh, loud cheer from all of the people who have been actually uh, listening to you in our main temple hall. And on their behalf, I am just uh, appreciating. Uh, now, I have been part I have Dr. Ramakrishna Rao with him. And he is the one who is... I, I think you can be in one, if you are moving, we can't hear you. All the trustees, they bought, they bought this whole hill on which this, uh, our temple is located. You'll be, uh, whenever things get normalized, we'll again invite you to come in person and meet the larger de devotee population in San Antonio. And I would now request Dr. Rao to go ahead and propose a vote of thanks and... Yes, this is not good. So many people are disconnect. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
go ahead. My apologies. <coughs> My apologies with a technical <coughs> hitch here. Now, uh, again, I would say uh, whenever things get normalized, and we would request you to come over to San Antonio and meet all, all our <coughs> not, uh, devoted uh, population here. You'll be very uh, pleased, and they will be extremely happy to meet you in person. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Swamiji. I'm handing over to Dr. Ramakrishna Rao, who is the founder trustee of our temple. He is the one who actually, along with other four trustees, bought this whole uh, hill on which our uh, temple is located. We have a very beautiful temple here. <coughs> <coughs> of Lord <coughs> Venkateshwar is your presiding de deity. Dr. Rao, please go ahead and propose a word of thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Om Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Devo Maheshwaraha Guru Sakshat Parabrahma Tasmai Shri Guru Venama Hari Hivom Pranam Swamiji. In the place of Guru, you have visited our temple. You have visited our hearts and you have brought beautiful message to our people here. And in yesterday's talk, you mentioned about that little girl who used to go to Banki Bihari Krishna's temple in near Mathura. And with that example, you made us feel that we also can offer our garlands to Banki Bihari and we can ask him to come to our home, not only home, to our hearts. And in that way, we had the darshan, a way in which we can have the sakshatkara of Bhagwan. And that is the purpose of these temples and the message that you have given was beautiful yesterday. And in today's talk that you have brought out, work is worship. And in that example, you have told that worship, not only when the priests do the puja, you also do the manasa puja. Temples are there to mold the personality, thinking, and the living of people and to improve them. And we need to have the support and the rem making the people remember that aspect of it. Temple is totally different from the shopping centers where we can go and buy or the universities where we can go and get the degrees. But whereas their temples are there to improve the personalities, enlightenment, enrichment of human beings. And for that, the people also should come prepared. And Swamiji, you have perfectly insisted on Chitta Shuddhi. Chitta Shuddhi has to be there along with Bhakya Shuddhi. Then only God will be willing to come and stay with us and bless us with what we need. And you have aptly mentioned Manava Samajas, they have different kinds of people. There are Daivi Manava Manavas and also ordinary Sadharana Manavas and Rakshasa Manavas and Rakshasa Rakshasa Manavas. Unfortunately, the population is tending towards, more towards this uncultured, sophisticated physically and religiously, psychologically, spiritually, we are a lot of things. And these things have to be reminded by Swamiji's like you, where you are sitting there. You may be teaching the high intellectuals in MIT and Harvard. And everyone needs this kind of words of wisdom from people like you, who were inspired by great Ramakrishna Paramahamsa himself. We are really blessed to have you in these two days. And we hope to see that you come here physically and visit us. And I'm also glad to hear or heard that yesterday 
you visited our temple and you with your presence i am sure that our temple also has become more sanctified because tirthas are there when mahatmas visit the place and people who visit the temple who manage the temple who serve the temple they not only see the murti of god right in front of them slowly they need to make sure it is not just the stone statues but they are the living living gods who is there in the murti also who is existing everywhere and at the last point just i would like to say one little incident that i remember i want to share with you i am sure that you know about this just like banki bihari temple where they show bhagwan krishna with only one glance chanki darshan in south india there is a temple chidambaram temple mm-hmm. and people when they go to see shiva they just open the curtain and when the curtain is open they see only nothing but empty place empty space for ordinary human beings but people who take their thinking and imagination much further that empty space is not only in the chidambaram temple that is the entire space of parabrahma himself and they need to feel that in themselves and feel it forever in everybody and in everything and that is where they come to realization known as the enlightenment or whatever the spiritual upliftment these experiences they come with great places like not only banki bihari temple chidambaram temple and our temple what we see here and i hope the temple helps for us to grow much more and with your great thoughts i thank you very much and i am sure that you will be inspiring many people like this and i would like to conclude with adi shankar acharyas who says yadyat karma karomi tat akhilam shambho tava aradhana every bit of action what we do with what we do with our eyes with our hands and legs everything let that be your service kayena vacha manasendriya irva budhyatmana va a prakrityaihi swabhava karomi yadyat sakalam parasmai shri narayana eti samarpayan with this i would like to conclude once again mere pranam and man my dhanyavads to you priyo parahita sarisa dharma nahi bhai parapida sama nahi agha bhai om hari om tat sat namaste namaste to all the people who have been watching taking participation and who have been the volunteers of this temple for a long time and who have brought it up from nothing to something what we are seeing today namaste bye namaste